Spirit. The, how many fruit of the Spirit is there? The different characteristics. I know there's only one fruit, but of that one fruit, there's nine different characteristics. Did you know that? Isn't it interesting? Nine gifts and nine fruit, if you will. Did you know that the priestly robe had a, on the bottom of it, it had a bell, and then it had a pomegranate, and then it had a bell, and it had a pomegranate? Symbolic of the gifts and the fruit. Amen. But you know what? The pomegranate tempered the bell. They not only sounded the bell, gave it its sound, but it also tempered it, showing us that the fruit is what gives our gift its greatest expression, but it also tempers it so that it's best received. Isn't that cool? But what we'll find is that as we look at the uh, gifts of the Spirit here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, that they're broken into three different categories. Remember I told you about compartmentalizing. There are three that reveal. There are three that do. Some call them the power gifts. And then there are three that say. Okay? Now, go with me to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. It says, therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. The word men there is the Greek word anthropos, and it means mankind, male and female. So we, it's not a gender issue. God gives, gives gifts to men and women both. Now, what I want us to do with what time we have tonight is to consider about these gifts. All right? 1 Corinthians chapter, or excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm sure you're acquainted with this teaching. We are a tripart being. We are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a flesh and blood body. Amen? Now, so Jesus gives gifts unto people. So when he gives you the gift that he's given you, where is that gift? Did he give that gift to your body? To your flesh? Now, he didn't put the gift in your flesh, in, uh, in that, the flesh itself. You know what I mean? Did he put the gift in your soul? The mind, will, and emotions. Actually, well, some say mind, will, and emotions, but that can be deceiving because how many of you know that the spirit has, an, has a will as well? Jesus said in, in Matthew 26 and 41, he says, Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So there's a will of the spirit. How many of you remember over in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter uh, 14, it says, For if I will pray in the spirit, if I will sing in the spirit. See, that's talking about the will of the spirit. But then there is also the will of the soul or of the mind. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 12, he says, For if there is first a willing mind, talking about the gift there of them gathering together their offering. A willing mind. See, there are times when we will to do from our hearts, but our, uh, our spirit that is, but our flesh and or our soul dominates us and we don't act on it. For example, how many times, uh, not picking on anybody, but how many times we found ourselves with in our heart, it's like, man, I need to read my Bible. But we don't. Man, I need to, I need to spend time with the Lord. But we don't. See, that's our spirit, man. But then our flesh or our mind is getting in the way, and we don't. We allow other things to get in the way. All right? And then there are times when we want to do something in our mind. I'm sure you've experienced this before where you think you've got something going on in your head there. And you're like, man, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then in your heart, it's like, ah, man. You know, you just, you don't have peace about it. Well, you know, so our, our spirit and our soul and our body is not always in agreement. And so when God places these gifts in us, he doesn't place it in our body. He doesn't place it in our head. He places it in our spirit. He places it in us, the spirit being that we are. Okay? Whatever your gift is, it's not in your head. That means you can't think it out. 
Whatever your gift is, it's not in your body. That means you can't work it out through physical strength, abilities, and things like that. Your body will help you to use those, that gift or gifts, but you, the gift itself is not in your body. It's in your spirit. That's why spiritual growth and development is so important. See, we can have, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's just like myself. I, I'm, I'm called to be a pastor. God has given me the gift of pastoring. But what if I didn't uh, uh, develop myself spiritually? What if I didn't grow spiritually? What if I didn't uh, grow and develop spiritually? It would handicap that ministry. It would hinder that from coming forth. What if I didn't uh, renew my mind? What if I still thought like I did when I came to the Lord September the 9th, 1979? What if I pastored that way? What if I still allowed my flesh to behave the way it did when I first got saved? Man, that would undermine my ministry. No matter what I could say here, it would be undone out there. That's why we have a saying that, that only your character can keep you where your gifts take you. I'll say it again. Only your character can keep you where your gifts take you. See, you can be incredibly gifted by God, but your character is the only thing that's going to keep your, your gifting going in the right direction and keep it where God wants it and make it effective. And your character is the real you that's developed through your relationship with Christ. This is also why it's so important for us to renew our minds. See, I'm convinced that every one of you, you, whether you know it or not, I'm convinced that every one of you have a gift from God. The Bible tells me so. Every one of you are gifted by God and some, one of, some gift there, every one of you have it, and maybe more than one. But here's what I know, is that no matter how gifted you are, if you do not develop yourself spiritually, it will limit that gift. Because remember, think of it this way. That pastoral gift is in me spiritually. Spiritually, How many of you can see me, the spirit being? You can't. You, can, you only see my body. You see me talking to you. But you can't see me. I'm inside this body. Amen? And I have a soul, my mind, and my emotions. Right? So what happens is, this pastoral gift has to be able to flow through Alan, the spirit being, through Alan's mind and Alan's body. Me standing right here, right now, talking to you, sharing with you, that requires me to cooperate with that gift. What if I'm not cooperating with the gift of God? I'm talking about me, the real me. What if I choose? I mean, what, what if I'm just having one of those days and I cop an attitude and I just, me personally, I'm just not going to flow with it. Guess what? It's not going to flow. But what if I'm into it with all my heart? I've sold out. I'm 100% committed to God that I'm going to be the pastor that he's called me to be. But I don't do anything with my mind. It's going to limit my ministry. I don't do anything with my body. It's going to limit my ministry. See, this is why the Bible talks to us about renewing our minds and, and, and crucifying the flesh. That's not a popular subject anymore these days because people don't want to crucify their flesh. Actually, it's a subject people run from anymore. See, many people have been given gifts from God only to treat them like the talent that was buried in the ground. Remember that? These gifts have been buried in the flesh and covered over by the soul. They are buried in graves of the past and in hopelessness. In this season of Christmas and giving gifts, let us remember the gifts that God has entrusted to us. And if we don't know what they are, then let's make it a personal uh, discovery to, uh, to discover what the gifts are that he has entrusted to us. Remember in Romans chapter 12 and verse 6, it tells us according to the grace given. You don't have to try to work at it. You don't have to. Grace, I love grace. Grace is so awesome. Grace, you know, one of the definitions for grace is God's unmerited favor. I love that. I remember when I first came uh, back to the Lord and started living for God, I, I, that was the first definition I learned about grace was, that, was God's unmerited favor. 
Wow, you mean God actually favors me? Yeah. What did I do for? Absolutely nothing. Truth is, if you took everything I had done, I, I didn't deserve any of it. I was unfavorable, but God chose to favor me anyway. Another definition for grace is God's ability to do in and through you what you otherwise could not do. I love that one too. See, God's grace makes it possible for me to be a pastor. I still have to cooperate with it. I have to do my part. But thank God for his grace. Amen. You know what? It was through God's grace that God revealed to me to be a pastor. And so I share that with you because you need to understand that whatever your gifting is, if you don't know what you are gifted by God, then I promise you all you have to do is lean on God's grace and God will show you what it is that he has gifted you. As I mentioned to you before at the beginning there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it tells us that the gifts are for the profit of people. Whatever God's gift has been given to you, it's in order to make you a blessing to others. I think that's an important thing to always remember. Whatever your gift is, it makes you a blessing to others. It's not about you. It's about others. Amen. And then in Ephesians chapter 4 uh, uh, in verse 12, if you read there through verse 16, I won't do all that tonight with you, but I would just encourage you to take that and look at that uh, because whatever gifts you have, they will fit with that. Whatever gift God has given you, it will fit with that. The gift that God gives you helps equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The gifts that God has given you helps you to edify the body of Christ. That word edify means to build like a house. It will help build the body of Christ. Whatever gifts God has given you, it will encourage the unity of faith. If God has given you a gift, it will help people to be unified in the faith. It doesn't cause division. It causes unity. See? So I would encourage you to look through the, uh, that portion of Scripture, again, in Ephesians 4, 12 through 16, and, and, and make note of that, because that's one of the ways you'll be able to, uh, to examine yourself and, and see how your gift functions and flows in, in order to be a blessing to others. Amen. Thank you, Father God. Father, I thank you and praise you for this opportunity to be able to share along these lines with those that are here and those that would be watching. I thank you, Father God, that you are faithful. Thank you, Lord, that you have given gifts unto